Today I'll try to answer a new law question from the comments. This time I started a vote and you decided for what happens to the various peoples of Middle Earth after they die. The question was sent in by Derek Bronk. As always I try to pronounce names as described by Tolkien and spoiler warning. The edifying topic of death and afterlife is also a difficult one in Tolkien's universe if you go into detail, which I will try. For length's sake I will have to take a few shortcuts though and this video still became very long. Death is a fundamental and some would say a final element in our existence, but it also plays an important role in Tolkien's work, same with many other fictional stories and universes. Many characters die in battles or under unusual circumstances in Lord of the Rings and we have different motives and ideas tied to this. Age, heroism, redemption, sacrifice, but also being a small wheel trapped between the tides of fate. I hope it will become clear what I mean by this later. Of course it would not be talking if this matter would not be at places quite complex. To truly approach this topic we have to talk about a few other problems first, so prepare for a long introduction. The biggest problem is defining something like a book canon. So what books and texts are part of the what I think is the universe and what not. This can differ from person to person. For me Tolkien's two main works, The Hobbit and especially The Lord of the Rings are canon. Also The Silmarillion, excluding some small editorial mistakes like Gilgalad's parents. And how canon The Silmarillion is can be debated. I also consider some parts of The Unfinished Tales to be canon, where it makes sense. Same with Tolkien's letters. The problematic part are the contents of the History of Middle Earth books, which are very interesting to read and also important, but sometimes they make things difficult. The idea behind them is explaining the process of Tolkien creating his main books, why the Silmarillion is the way it is and what its problems are and to publish notes and ideas Tolkien worked on in the background. So this contains obviously unfinished material, probably never intended to be published, which can be difficult to place in his universe. But why is all this so important for this video? A lot of information about death and afterlife can be found inside the history of Middle Earth books. Not considering them would make a very short and at times speculative video because we don't know too much about many details otherwise. So to answer this question it comes a bit down to my personal interpretation and my opinion on what is canon. I can of course only explain this question through my view and understanding of it and I'll try to not contradict the main works including the Silmarillion. So what's the problem with the Silmarillion? It was never finished by Tolkien himself but instead by his son and editor Christopher Tolkien who also had birthday recently. He published it posthumously and some topics and decisions can be heavily discussed because Tolkien changed his mind quite often about certain topics. And when everything is linked together in your books the smallest change can affect a lot of other parts of everything else. For some of his later ideas Tolkien needed to basically rewrite big parts of his books which made finishing the Silmarillion without too many contradictions to the other works an insanely difficult task for Christopher Tolkien and even he himself is not 100% sure if the Silmarillion he published represents his father's ideas correctly at all. The origin of orcs is a very good example for this. However he explains his decisions in detail in the history of Middle Earth books which we will need to understand the concept of death in Tolkien's universe, mainly the book Morgoth's Ring. And now we slowly come to the actual answer, sorry for that. I start with the firstborn, the elf, but there is one character I have to introduce first. The Valar Mandos, his actual name is Namo and Mandos is his realm. Like for example Hades, the name of his realm became his actual name too. You will often hear the term Halls of Mandos in this video. Namo or Mandos is a Valar, so to say a high angel of Eru who is God. He is also part of something similar to a God pantheon formed by multiple Valar and his task is judgment in matters of fate. I like this phrase. This includes the final fate of many beings, death. 
He is also called the Doomsman of the Valar, and he summons the dead into his halls. His judgment also has a lot of weight, not to say that only one entity overpowers him in this regard, which is Eru. Of course, he speaks to Manwe, who is the leader of the Valar, and coordinates with him too. The Doomsman himself is also quite powerful, for example, even Sauron's master Morgoth, or Melkor as he was originally called, could not leave his realm against his will and Melkor was considered the most powerful Valar. With this we have the foundation of how death works in Tolkien's universe. If you die, Mandos summons your soul or spirit into his halls, but what happens then? This depends on who is summoned. Each race in Lord of the Rings has its own fate upon death. The firstborn elves have a quite interesting one. They are bound to the world called Arda itself and don't need to die by natural means, but can for example be slain. The binding part here is very important to understand. They also age very slowly and under certain circumstances it seems even a bit faster. For example, the Cinder Lord Círdan, the shipwright, is described as looking old and having a long white beard. I have a long lore video about him if you're interested. Elves having beard seems unusual, which it is, but he is incredibly old and very old elves can have a beard, even looking old, but they don't die of age. Círdan's case however is special because he never left Middle Earth until probably the fourth age, so after Sauron's defeat. Then he most likely went to Aman, the so-called Undying Lands. And this part is really important if you truly want to understand the elves and their fate. This goes into the direction of why elves have to leave Middle Earth. Middle Earth is, you could say, the product of the rebellion of the mentioned evil Valar Melkor or known as Morgoth, Sauron's master. With his rebellion and destructive evil deeds that changed the shape of the world and continents itself, he so to say infused the world with his corruption or evil. In case of Middle Earth this led to it being a place of chaos or let's say of change. The books use the term Mart and Arda Mart for the whole world, but also call it Morgoth Ring. So this corruption is the Ring of Morgoth. His evil tainted the concept and essence of the world and especially of Middle Earth, which would be otherwise perfect and symmetrical you could say. Aman on the literally other side is at least a bit different. Here the Valar live and have their realms all undying, which is why it's called the Undying Lands. And here the world is not changing much, it's still Mar too, but less. It does not have the chaos and corruption of Middle Earth. And when we come to men, you will understand why they are in most cases not allowed to enter Aman. Now what happens when elves don't leave Middle Earth? They are primarily tormented by its change because their nature is not to change much and at some point they will fade or be diminished. In Galadriel's words, we must depart into the west or dwindle to a rustic folk of dell and cave, slowly to forget and to be forgotten. Elves are bound to Arda and as the world slowly ages, they do too. Middle Earth changes more than Aman and its corruption is more intense and so this affects the elves stronger when they live there for a very long time. And that's why they have to leave it at some point. The nature clashes with the essence of Middle Earth, so to say. Now when elves die, their body stays behind and their spirit is summoned into the halls of Mandos. The summon can be refused, but that is very unwise for elves and not really explored in any of Tolkien's stories because they are not complete without a body. At some point after the summon, Mandos will judge them and if they were good elves, they can, if they want, receive Manwe's blessing and will be re-embodied in Aman after a while and live there again. Tolkien had different concepts for re-embodiment. First it was rebirth, where they are born again, have new parents and receive all their memories and knowledge back when they grow up again. Tolkien later distanced himself from this idea and his final stand seems that Manwe and the other Valar have the authority to recreate the old body without wounds of course, so the spirit can return to it and live again. 
The image of their physical form is so to say saved inside their spirits. There are a few more iterations of Tolkien's ideas but I can cover them all in detail. This also makes it clear that elves need a body. It's part of their existence which was a bit different in early concepts of Tolkien too. However, after explaining all this, I hope you see that this makes sense for the concept of elves. They are bound to Arda, but only the Undying Lands fit their being's nature, so when they die, they of course go and live on in this special place, as long as Arda is there. There are also some strange exceptions and rulings that I can cover in detail too. For example, the first original High King of the Noldor, Elf Finwë, had a wife called Miriel. They had a son, that is the often mentioned Feanor. Shortly after his birth, his mother died because her son's spirit was so powerful that he used too much of her life force or essence, so to say. Her spirit left her body and went to the halls of Mandos. Her body was, you could say, dead, but was preserved by the Valar of healing, so that it would not wither. You could say, no problem, she can be re-embodied or returned to her body. But she refused and stayed in the halls of Mandos instead. Finwë was in despair but was allowed to later take a new wife where his other children are from, for example Galadriel's father Finarfin. However, this generated a strange conflict because there was change, a new wife. For this to work, his former wife had to accept that she can't be re-embodied anymore. Later, when Finwë was slain by Morgoth, he offered Miriel that he stayed inside the halls of Mandos forever so that she can get re-embodied, which she accepted. It's a quite complex topic and difficult to explain, but I hope that you understand the concept of the elf fate with this a bit more. I should also mention that the Undying Lands were moved into the Unseen Realm in the Second Age after the fall of Numenor. So they are, you could say, moved away from the changing Arda and only the elves can reach it with their ships. However, the Undying Lands are still part of the world, but I think this removal underlines the concept even more. Now we come to men who are almost the antithesis of this concept. They are mortal and this is their essence. Mortality is their gift which they received from the one transcendent creator god Eru. It's often referred to as the gift of men. In contrast, men change and are fit for the task of living on a changing and corrupted world because they are not bound to it. They age, they work, they fight, they get sick and they die all in a very limited amount of time. While elves have all the time in the world to build their realms, men must achieve this with the little time they got and you could say are always driven and in haste, especially when young. On one side it's said that they have to leave the world forever at some point, but on the other side it's also their greatest and defining strength, the gift of men, which is death. In the Silmarillion we find a quite interesting remark about this. During mid-first age, a group of men arrived in Beleriand, the old west coast land of Middle-earth, and met the elves. They met Galadriel's oldest brother Finrod first and he and his people became friends with this group, which is also known as the Edain. They are divided into three houses and one was the house of Beor. I talk about this in my Kirdan and the history of the elves video. Now comes the interesting part. When Beor died of old age, we can read in the Silmarillion. And when he lay dead of no wound or grief, but stricken by age, the Eldar saw for the first time the swift waning of the life of men and the death of weariness which they knew not in themselves, and they grieved greatly for the loss of their friends. But Beor at the last had relinquished his life willingly and passed in peace, and the Eldar wondered much at the strange fate of men, for in all their law there was no account of it and its end was hidden from them. I really like this little story because it shows the contrast between both fates. While elves are bound to Arda, men are not. When men die, they are, I assume, summoned to Mandos Halls too. And then they go somewhere outside of Arda, to an unknown place, not the elves or even the Valar know about. Only Eru knows and this is also part of the gift of men. 
leaving Arda forever is their fate. And this is also a bit why they are not allowed to enter the undying lands. They are beings of change and a different fate awaits them. So they don't belong to Aman. If they would live in Aman, they would want immortality, rejecting the gift of men, which is against their nature. But of course there are more peoples living in Middle Earth, for example Hobbits. Hobbits are also counted towards men and share their fate. Half elves must decide for one side and their decision gives them the gift of men or not. But if they once accepted it, they are men and not half elves anymore. But if they decide to be elves, their children also inherit the right to decide. Beyond hobbits we have some other peoples like the Druedain, not to be confused with the Dunedain, but they all are counted towards men. Same with the Variaks from Kant, I assume. Then we have the dwarves. While the elves want to preserve and like the growing things above the earth, the dwarves love what is below the earth. They also love the mountains, which are to them what trees are for elves. Their bodies were created by Aule, the Valar of Smithing, who they revere. So their affinity to craftsmanship is natural for them. They are sturdy like rocks and ores, but not immortal. Corresponding this, they live quite long compared to men who are not Dunedain, so about 200 to 350 years. Their fate tries to fit into all of this. When they die, they are summoned into the halls of Mandos II, where they, according to their beliefs, wait until an unmarred Arda is created and then they will help Aule to build and form it. Next would be the Ainur, that is a race of the Valar and their helpers of lowering the Mayar. The Ainur are spirit beings, I would compare them to angels. They are immortal and can exist as spirit beings alone, but usually they take a physical form. When their body is destroyed, they lose a big portion of their power, which went into the creation of it and can be diminished, for example, to a mere shadow, depending on if they rebelled with Melkor or not. Sauron and Saruman are examples where this happened. Gandalf, in contrast, was sent back, his form changed a bit, his lost power was restored and even expanded, you could say, because he fought against Melkor and his servants, sacrificed himself for the greater good and still had an important task. Still, even if they are diminished to nothingness, to my understanding they are not gone, just have no power and no way to recover anymore. This also has to do with not being able to return to Aman and heal and that Eru and the Valar put this fate upon them. Those spirit beings can change or create fate to some degree and they can also change the world but in this exiled and diminished form they lose all their power. So losing their physical form is quite bad for Morgoth's servants who are Ainur. Sauron could trick this due to him having the One Ring, which had a big part of his will and power in it. Now we shortly come to a few special cases, for example the Ents. They are immortal too, but what happens when their body gets destroyed? Well, I don't know and Tolkien wrote in a letter, what happens to the Ents, I don't yet know. In my Antwife video I explained their origin a bit and if I recall correctly I also explained the origin story of the dwarves. You could say they are also the antithesis to them. The dwarves wait to help Aule, maybe the ants wait for Yavanna to grow things and help her on Arda unmarred. They are definitely bound to the world. This is however not explained or mentioned by Tolkien and just a theory of mine. Also, if the new unmarred world would have no woods, they would have no purpose because they protect the growing things from the orcs and dwarves. So maybe without those, they lose purpose and cease to exist. But when there are trees, there could be ants, I guess. There's also the argument of them being Ainur too. Then they would share their fate and be truly immortal. Another interesting case are the Nazgul. They are bound to Sauron's fate, so when Sauron is diminished, they are too. Barrow Whites are probably corrupted Ainur or spirit beings. From my perspective, they share the fate of Ainur, who are Morgoth or Sauron's servants. The Oathbreakers were cursed by Isildur and this curse accepted by Eru, so they were not summoned and trapped in this ghost form. After they fulfilled the oath that they once broke, they redeemed themselves and I assume share the fate of men. Then there are the nameless things. 
Well, no idea. They are probably beasts and cease to exist, but we know nothing about them. Orcs fate is a very tough one because of the orc origin debate. Even if they were once elves, they lost their immortality, so maybe they accepted the gift of men? In Tolkien's later notes, he wanted them to be corrupted men instead of elves. And here we are at the problem when it comes to canon. We know Tolkien later changed his mind, but this change conflicts with the source material because orcs lived before men. Still, they are mortals and in theory could redeem themselves too. In this case they would probably go where men go. If they can't redeem themselves, their fate is bound to that of Morgoth's servants. Then we have trolls and I have to admit no clue. We don't know much about their origin. I assume Morgoth transformed beings into trolls as a mockery of the ants. So they were probably beasts or like orcs. The old dragons were creatures possessed by an evil spirit, so potentially spirit beings. They were servants of Morgoth, so they share the same fate as Sauron. The later dragons could be potentially like beasts or animals, so they would cease to exist after their death I assume. The great eagle's fate is also a tough one. As explained in the Why do eagles not fly the one ring to Mordor video, eagles could be originally Maiar, so they would be immortal Ainur. Tolkien later changed his mind, but this did not make it into the Silmarillion. Depending on what you see as canon, they are or are not. If we take Tolkien's later writings, they are only more intelligent beasts and would cease to exist. I personally like the Ainur interpretation more and one reason for Tolkien that he revised this was that they had offspring. This is true for Melian too, but I see the problem. Then we have nature spirits and other special entities. I would go with the similar to Ainur argument. Tom Bombadil's fate is difficult, but in my opinion he is bound to Arda. As long as Arda is there, he is there too. When it comes to Ungoliant, Shelob's mother, I could imagine that she is bound to darkness. As long as there's darkness and shadow, there is Ungoliant devouring herself. The fate of Shelob is also difficult. I would say her body can die, her spirit could be diminished or bound to her mother's fate. Same with her offspring, but maybe they would be only beast and stop to exist. You see, in many cases fate and sometimes purpose play a big role and are very important if you want to understand what happens after a being's death. Except for men, all others are bound to Arda and the universe surrounding it. As long as those exist, they have a place and even a fate in them. Thank you for watching. This video got again far longer than I expected, but I also answered the question in a lot of detail. Therefore I reduced a bit of workload during editing. I still hope you liked it. Let me know in the comments. Also consider pressing the like button and if you have more lore questions for future videos, let me know too. I will most likely post a new poll for the next video's topic in the community tab too. The Twitter voting last time was not that successful, but I was really surprised how many people voted on YouTube. Not sure what video will be next, maybe a gaming related video and another answering lore question from the comments video will come too. Again, thank you for watching and goodbye.